Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. If you've been following along, we just wrapped up our video series on the different treatment options that were available for kidney stones. And the purpose of today's conversation, we're going to be evaluating the American Urological Association's guidelines or handbook, which is what your urologist is likely going to reference in order to make a recommendation on how to treat your kidney stone. If you're interested in this information in written format in much, much more detail, I would encourage you to check out our blog, our education blog, on our website, and there is a link below in the description. Now, before we move forward, I would encourage you to hit that subscribe button down in the bottom right hand corner. This helps get this information in front of fellow kidney stone sufferers like you and me and get some access to the information that they need in order to take control of their kidney stones. Now, without further ado, let's dive in. So, the American Urological Association's handbook really walks urologists through the different processes and all the research really in a very step-by-step -step fashion. And we're gonna go through in a very similar fashion today. So the first place that a urolo urologist or any medical professional dealing with a potential kidney stone is diagnosis. So for first kidney stones, the American Urological Association recommends non-contrast CT scans. And the reason that they recommend this is because CT is the most powerful option that is available for identifying kidney stones. And above and beyond just giving stone location and stone size, it also provides the urologist with stone density, also known as attenuation. And this is useful for a whole host of things. And if you're interested, we actually have a video on that and I'll link a card up at the top. But density helps us understand the specific stone type and it will also point to the different treatment options that are going to be appropriate for that stone's density and makeup. So non-contrast CT is going to be incredibly important for the first time that you get a kidney stone. There is a trade-off though, because CT comes with some pretty healthy doses of radiation, which is generally you want to avoid. So for future kidney stones, the American Urological Association recommends ultrasound. And the reason that they recommend this is because ultrasound will be pretty good at identifying a kidney stone's location and giving a rough estimate of the size. And those are generally the two big things that they need to understand once they are aware of your kidney stone type, because they've identified the type and the density from that first non-contrast CT scan. And your kidney stone type is very rarely ever going to change over the course of your lifetime unless you've made pretty dramatic lifestyle or dietary changes, which could spur a change. But for most people, this is not going to be likely. Now, the next piece of this is a 24-hour urine culture. And this is something that is missed so often and is so disconcerting because it is incredibly important. There is a lot of information that can be obtained from this, but the biggest thing that urologists and surgeons need to be looking out for is infection. And infection is a very, very serious complication when it comes to kidney stones. Fortunately, it's pretty rare, but if there is an infection, that needs to be treated first and foremost before anything else is done with that kidney stone. And the only way that you're gonna be able to determine that is if you get a 24-hour urine culture. Now, when it comes to actually treating kidney stones, the American Urological Association breaks everything out based on stone location, stone size, and then lastly, there are a few different notes that are made based on particular stone types. So the first thing that we're gonna evaluate are stones in the ureter. And these are gonna be the most common presentation of kidney stones that medical professionals are gonna see, whether they're an ER or whether they're a urologist, because typically there's a, a pain-related event that occurs and people go in to try to find out what's happening. And this is usually stones in the ureter. So for uncomplicated kidney stones in the ureter, less than 10 millimeters in size, the American Urological Association recommends expulsive therapy. Now, when I say uncomplicated, what I mean by this is that there's no uncontrolled pain and the stone is not causing any kind of severe obstruction to urine flow. Normally, you're just gonna be able to urinate normally. You may have pain every now and then, but it is manageable. That is the definition of uncomplicated. Now, let's say that expulsive therapy fails. First thing that they're gonna recommend is ureteroscopy. And if that's not an option or you don't like that, shockwave lithotripsy is the next option that they're gonna recommend. But there are some trade-offs with this. So the reason that they're recommending ureteroscopy as the first line option is because ureteroscopy has a higher stone free rate 
in a single session. So that means they're gonna remove more or all of your kidney stone in a single session when compared to shockwave lithotripsy. It's more efficient. However, there is a trade-off. Ureteroscopy comes with a much, much higher rate of complication than shockwave lithotripsy. So you kind of have to take some of the good with the bad when you're making your decision on what you want to do. Now, they further go on to classify based on location and stone type. So for stones that are in the mid or lower urinary tract, ureteroscopy is gonna be recommended. For stones that are in the upper urinary tract, shockwave lithotripsy. And for cysteine or uric acid stones, ureteroscopy is going to be recommended as the first line option for these. Now, if ureteroscopy or shockwave lithotripsy fails, the next line of option that they're gonna recommend is percutaneous nephrolithotomy. And this is a moderately invasive technique for treating kidney stones. It's been around for a very long time. If you'd like to learn more about that, we have a video on it up in the top hand corner here. Moving on now to stones in the kidney. So the American Neurological Association breaks this apart based on whether that stone is located in the lower pole or not. Because the lower pole of the kidney, and remember if you're thinking about the kidney like a bucket, and I know this is a crude analogy, but we've got the upper, we got the mid, and then we got the lower. And the lower portion of the kidney, this is most complicated, uh, this is the most complicated location for kidney stones because not only are the stones fighting gravity, forcing them down and keeping them down in that lower pole, but if they're trying to spontaneously pass, it's difficult for that stone to fight gravity, come up through the urine and get into the renal pelvis, into the ureter to be able to get flushed through the bladder and out through your urethra. And the same thing is true when we're talking about breaking up these stones or treating them with a procedure like ureteroscopy. You've got to get the different tools into the different calluses of the kidney and that lower pole just causes problems. So they've broken this out and made recommendations based on that location. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is non-lower pole stones. So this is gonna be upper or mid calyx level stones. So for symptomatic stones, and symptomatic meaning you've probably had a pain event, you're aware of that kidney stone that's causing problems with urination or just pain, that's symptomatic. So for stones that are less than 20 millimeters, in the upper or mid calyx of a kidney, they're gonna recommend shockwave lithotripsy first, followed by ureteroscopy. For stones that are symptomatic that are larger than 20 millimeters, they are gonna almost always recommend percutaneous nephrolithotomy. And they also make a special note here about not recommending shockwave lithotripsy, because shockwave lithotripsy is a very, very popular technique for treating kidney stones. It's non-invasive and it just kind of blasts them all apart into particles that you then have to pass through your urine just like you would be passing a kidney stone if you didn't have any type of intervention. And for stones that are larger than 20 millimeters, they don't recommend this because with all those fragments, they can kind of have a tendency to compound on themselves and cause something called Steinstrasse. This means Stone Street in German. So basically, if you envision your ureter just getting jam-packed of kidney stone fragments, kind of like a cobblestone street, and this can cause some pretty serious problems. So for stones that are larger than 20 millimeters in the kidney, shockwave lithotripsy is not recommended. Now, asymptomatic or non-obstructing stones in the kidney. So stones that are not causing you any pain, they're not interrupting urine flow, they're not impacting kidney function rates, they're just hanging out there. And these stones are typically stones that are identified on some sort of an ancillary type of scan that's been performed or imaging where, hey, there's a kidney stone there, we found some kidney stones when they're going in and imaging something else. So for these, the American Urological Association recommends observation. And observation is something that is just, it boggles our minds, but it is missed so much because we are so surgery happy here in the United States. If you've got a kidney stone that's been identified, most likely your urologist is gonna go in and they're gonna wanna attack it and they wanna recommend surgery. Sometimes doing nothing and just waiting to see what happens with that kidney stone to see if it just breaks apart on its own with some weaker density stones as possible, or passes on its own spontaneously. So observation is recommended by the American Urological Association for stones that are not causing you any difficulty. Now, when it comes to lower pole stones, and again, these are stones that are located kind of at the bottom of the bucket of your kidney, 
For symptomatic stones that are less than 10 millimeters, shockwave lithotripsy is going to be the first recommendation, followed by ureteroscopy. For stones that are greater than 10 millimeters, they're going to recommend percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Down along the same lines as with above here, shockwave lithotripsy is not recommended because, again, they are concerned about all those stone fragments compacting and causing complications. Now, if you are not a candidate for percutaneous nephrolithotomy, they are going to recommend staged ureteroscopy. And what this means is, over the course of successive sessions of surgery, over the course of time, they're going to go in with ureteroscopy and start to break apart those stones in a successive manner to be able to minimize um, the impact to you and to be able to attack that kidney stone in a more hmm, staged out process uh, that will allow for a higher degree of stone clearance, especially again if you are not a candidate for percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Now, the last part here comes to dealing with what happens once you've passed your stone. And this is something that is missed so often. I, I would dare to say it's probably missed in about 99% of individuals that we talk to over the course of a year, which is a lot. After you pass that stone, you want to bring it into your urologist and have it analyzed. From this analysis, you are going to be able to obtain a whole host of information that is going to help you not only in treating potentially future kidney stones, but preventing them. Because once you understand the type of stone, you can then link this to what is actually causing this stone to form. Because every single stone type, and there are many of them, forms for a specific and unique reason. So understanding that composition is so essentially important and the American Urological Association agrees. However, in practice, it almost never happens. So it is your responsibility to take that stone in and ask for it to be analyzed. Now, there's a lot of information, not only today that we've covered and in those previous videos, and that can be overwhelming, especially if you're in the process of dealing with a kidney stone. So we have made a guide that will help explain things in a very, very easy to understand format. We've got a free PDF that you can download. It is a decision tree that's based on your stone's location, size, and a number of other factors. And then it's also a quick reference sheet for all the different treatment options that are also available for kidney stones. So this is something that you can take with you on your phone or just print out and have ready to be able to have a discussion with your urologist. And if you're getting a recommendation that is contrary to what you're seeing here, it is not necessarily for you to challenge your urologist, but just to have a discussion with them because there may be some factors that you're not aware of that they're taking into consideration. But the more information that you have, the better equipped you're going to be to be able to handle what's coming your way in terms of a surgical procedure or another treatment option. Knowledge is power. So if you're interested in this, please head on over to stone-relief.com slash pages slash procedures to download this free PDF. Thank you everybody for tuning in and please leave any questions or comments below in the video. We do answer all of them. We will see you again in the next video.